Let's turn once again in the Gospel of John, the first chapter, and reading verses 23 through 28. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. I'm reminded this week of the song, is that composed by Bach or Beethoven? Ten little speckled frogs. So, <laughs> reminded uh, this week of that song, Ten little speckled frogs sat on a speckled log Eating some most delicious bugs. One jumped into the pool where it was nice and cool. Now there are nine little speckled frogs. We, we began with 52 Lord's Days. And then Mother's Day took one away to where it was 51. And then Father's Day made it 50. And Super Sunday makes it 49. 52 little speckled frogs. That on. So... Serious stuff. God uh, places his Sabbath very high. It's in the first table of the law. That's not fooling with Mother Nature. <laughs> it's fooling with the holiness of God. Last week we had three points regarding the fact that the word gospel, as we all know, I hope we know by now, is uh, in the original, is euangelion. You meaning good. Euthanasia, we know, means, or we should know, uh, means good death. It's good. <laughs> it's good to put these old people to death. Uh, good death. Euangelion is good message or good news. But last week we were seeking to point out that this good news is not good news subjectively. It is not good insofar as we think it's good. It's objective good news. The first point being that it is good news objectively because it is truth. Water may be and is cheaper than gas. But if you put gas in your, if you put water in your gas tank, you will discover that as far as transportation goes, it is more economically feasible to put gas in your gas tank than water. It's good news objectively because it's truth. The natural man will never understand, will never understand as long as he's a natural man, that truth is more economical than lies. When I came back from China, I visited uh, one of my students at the uh, Christian college where I taught in America, and I discovered that he's, what I already knew, that the Chinese pick up on the, the wickedness of Americans much, much, much more quickly than they ever pick up on the proclamation of the gospel. I was talking with him, and he said, it is simply not economically feasible. It's not possible economically speaking, to make it without sending your wife out into the workplace. Well, let me ask you, is it economically feasible to destroy your children by taking your wife out of the home? Well, a few years ago, somebody pointed out something that I never thought of. Did you know? See, this, this spiral, this vortex, as it were, started quite a ways back. The Industrial Revolution took the husband out of the home. That was the first thing. 
The husband and wife were originally both in the home. The Industrial Revolution took the husband out of the home. And then the wife was taken out of the home. Uh, my college roommate and I, when we were about 19 years old, were talking to this guy in his mid-20s who was very handsome, very muscular. We asked him, Bob, are you married? To which he responded, why buy the cow when the milk's free? Hopefully, Bob discovered, if he didn't continue the ignoramus that he was, hopefully, Bob discovered that that $2.89 a gallon milk was really something akin to $289 a gallon. <laughs> Relations outside of marriage isn't economical. It's very expensive. Huh? You got that? So, what's the point we're trying to make? The gospel is objective good news because it is truth, meaning truth, biblical truth, is the owner's manual, which is always good news. Not if all else fails. Secondly, we said that the gospel is good news because it is about justice. And justice is always good news. Whether we, subjectively speaking, we like to believe it or not. No signal. Justice is always good news. Men, I've discovered in the line of work that I'm engaged in, that people who love to perpetuate injustice, economically speaking. Have you noticed this? People who love, economically speaking, people who love to perpetuate uh, uh, injustice on other people, economically speaking, are the most at one of the same time. They're the most irate when that same injustice is, is, is perpetrated on them. Justice is always good news. Thirdly, we said that the gospel is good news, objectively speaking, because it brings the sinner to total despair, which is the only avenue to hope. Hope comes through total and utter despair. And so we said that we do not say, as I've frequently heard in the past and I used to agree with, that you have to tell the bad news before you tell the good news. Let's look at a passage which, which points this out rather clearly. Acts 2. Beginning with verse 22. This is the Apostle Peter. When you compare, for example, Peter's, this is one of two sermons that are similar. The Apostle Peter's sermons and Stephen's sermon uh, taken from Acts chapter 7. Compare these sermons with the sermons that we most frequently hear today. Stark contrast. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by, approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you. As ye yourselves also know. Notice he's leading up to something. Jesus of Nazareth. Here's the guy I'm talking about. The man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders. Things you've never seen of or imagined. He performed before. Verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And then over to verse 36, he continues. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, once more, he says, that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, here's the point. If the gospel driving you to total despair, drives you to a hopeless condition, you would not have verse 37. You got it? Do you see it? 
If the gospel, if the law which precedes the gospel drives you to total despair, if that is your, if hope indeed springs from total despair, then you wouldn't have, which is to say, if the gospel in driving you to total despair drives you to hopelessness, you wouldn't have verse 37 because verse 37 says what? Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? There's hope. You got it? If it was total hopelessness, they wouldn't ask that question. The gospel in leading us to total despair leads us to the only hope that has ever obtained since the fall of man. But partial dis- despair leads to violent destruction. Total despair leads is the only avenue to hope, whereas partial despair leads to violent destruction. Psalm 50 points this out. Beginning with verse 21. Let's start with verse 20. Or verse 19. Psalm 50 verse 19. Thou givest thy mouth to evil. And thy tongue frameth deceit. Frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Notice verse twenty. One, these things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Meaning, partial despair is violent destruction. How do I get that out of there? What do we say that the monster sin is? The monster sin is a sin of self-righteousness. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. Meaning what? You thought that I would be like you and think, yeah, well, I did that wrong and I did something else wrong, but basically I'm a good person. But guess what? The monster sin is the sin of self-righteousness. Say it loud. What's the... What's the ethnic group in our society that's going down even faster than we are, than this ethnic group? What is the ethnic group in our society? It's the ethnic group whose leaders tell them, Say it loud! I'm black and I'm proud. The monster sin is the sin of self-righteousness. I was telling Raoul this week that Christians are the only people who think. Christians are the only people who think. Years ago, uh, I was thinking and uh, contemplating the relationship between Titus 3.3 3 Titus chapter 3 verse 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. How can we put this verse together with the fact that Everywhere we go, someone is asking us, how are you doing? How are you doing? Why? Hateful and hate. Given the fact that the scripture says that person, if he's not a regenerate person, he doesn't give a flip about how I'm doing. How do we put these two things together? We are hateful and hating one another and people are constantly asking us how we are doing. Since... You get the idea. What's the question? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? 
Since this person doesn't give a flip about how I'm doing, why does he ask me how I... It can't be because he cares about how I'm doing. And here's the answer I came up with. When you ask someone, and I hear people among us still doing it, still asking people, how are you doing? When you ask someone how you're doing, you're not expressing care, concern for the state of the other person's being. What you're saying is... I am a good person. Now, do you suddenly, when you become a Christian, do you suddenly, does that suddenly, the meaning of that phrase, does that suddenly change? How are you doing? It means I'm a good person. Hey, I just proved it. I asked this person how he's doing. Repentance. No. Getting back to... uh, Last week, we're speaking of repentance today. Last week, we said that uh, 1 Timothy 2, 5, there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. There's one mediator between God and man and, remember what we said? There's also one mediator between man and Christ. And what is that? Remember? Remember? One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And there is also, which we don't frequently hear, there is one and only one mediator between man and Christ, and that is repentance. That's why we have the, the, the voice crying in the wilderness. John the Baptist's message was a message in, in verse 21, which we just read. Let's read it again. Excuse me, verse 23. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Repent. The doctrine of repentance. Because repentance is the only mediator between man and Christ. The best, perhaps the best commentary ever written on the Gospel of John. Written by George Hutchison. Listen to what he says. Profound comments on this verse. Listen to what George Hutchison says. Albeit that Christ commands us to prepare his way. That he may show us. Listen to the. I mean you talk about economy. One thing that sticks out in your minds. About Calvin. About uh, Luther. About John Owen. About George Hutchison. Here's what it is. Economy of words. What do I mean by that? These guys can say more things in fewer words than anyone I've ever read. Albeit that Christ commands us to prepare His way, that He may show us our duty and make use of exhortations as a mean whereby He works upon His own. Yet this work of preparation, repentance, is not in our power but must be His work whose reward is with Him and His work before Him and unto such as He convinceth of their own inability. He will first come with a work of conversion unto faith and repentance that this may make way for His coming with consolation and sensible manifestation. Therefore, in this command, sweetened, Therefore, is this command sweetened with a promise? Phenomenal statement by George Hutchison. Acts 17.30, I think we mentioned last week, where it says, God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. We're going to have two points this week. The first point is this. The command of God. John the Baptist. Voice crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, repent. His message was a message of repentance. First of all, God's command through John the Baptist to repent with respect to the reprobate is not, does not deal with futurition, but with obligation. Does not deal with futurition, but with obligation. What do we mean by that? Negatively speaking, This command with respect to the reprobate. Okay, we have the picture back. This command with respect to the reprobate does not deal with futurition. 
An excellent example of this is found in, uh, well, John, the ba- uh, uh, John Calvin is, uh, John the Baptist, John Calvin. <laughs> John Calvin is explaining a verse of Scripture. This, is, this isn't his concept. This didn't come from him. The command of God to the reprobate to repent does not deal with futurition. What do we mean by that? That the Lord sends his word to many whose blindness he intends to increase. That the Lord sends his word, his his command to repent to many whose blindness he intends to increase thereby. Cannot indeed be called in question. Can't even question that if you know the Bible. For what purpose does he cause so many demands to be made upon Pharaoh? Is it because he hoped to soften his heart by oft-repeated embassies? No. Before he began, he both had known and had foretold the outcome. Go, the Lord said to Moses, and declare my will to Pharaoh, but I will harden his heart so that he will not obey. Does not deal with futurition, meaning what? Let me explain it. God's command... To the reprobate, to repent, does it not deal with, does not mean that God desires something to come to pass in the future which is not present reality. Does that make sense? Okay, the reprobate, are they repenting now? Do they have repentance now? No. So when God commands them to repent, it's not an expression that God desires something, meaning repentance, to be future reality, which is not present reality. It doesn't deal with futurition. Um, Does not deal with futurition, but it deals with, and listen once again to uh, Hutchison. It does not express God's desiring something to come to pass in the future which is not present reality. Albeit that Christ commands us to prepare His way that He may show us our duty. Does not deal with futurition but of obligation. He commands the reprobate to repent to show him what is his duty. Not futuristic, but of obligation. Now, let me issue a warning here. You will hear, if you haven't heard thus far, you will hear the Calvinists in the future. And don't be fooled by this question. When God, for example, just to give you an example, they might ask a question like this. When God commands us, thou shalt not bear false witness. They're denying this because this this is related to the free offer, by the way. See, when God commands somebody, he really desires that they respond to that command. The reprobate even. Okay. So, uh, this warning is, they'll ask a question like this. When God says, thou shalt not bear false witness, when we proclaim that indiscriminately, when God commands all men everywhere not to bear false witness, does he desire... That the reprobate bear false witness? He commanded them not to bear false witness. Does he desire that they bear false witness? As soon as you say no, you're in a corner. How so? To say that God desires that the reprobate stop lying is akin to God's Desiring to square a circle. Does that make sense? To say that God desires that the reprobate, who by their very nature, Job 15, 15 and 16 says, the reprobate drink iniquity like water. Lying to the reprobate. What does Psalm 58, 3 say? Say, the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking life. Lying to an unregenerate man is just as natural as breathing is to him. 
So does God desire, apart from salvation, that he stop lying? Come on, can anything be any more ludicrous than that? So, what does God, what is God's purpose in proclaiming and commanding the reprobate to repent? It does, does not deal with futurition, but he's telling him his obligation to repent. And so, this is his duty. So, with regard to the reprobate, God's commands, including the command of repentance, serves two purposes. The first thing is to show him his duty. The second purpose in commanding the reprobate to repent is to increase his inexcusability. Well, you never told me that I should... He did tell you. And so your inexcusability is increased. Secondly, we're dealing with the command to repent. The first point was with respect to the reprobate. It deals with his duty. Uh, It does not deal with futurition, but of obligation. It tells him what his duty is. Secondly, the command to repent with regard to the elect. Let's look again at Hutchison's statement. What's the purpose in God's commanding his people, even his people which are yet unregenerate? What's his purpose in commanding them to repent? Christ commands us to prepare his way that he may show us our duty and make use of exhortations as a mean whereby he works upon his own. You get that? that he may show us our duty and make use of exhortations as a mean whereby he works upon his own. What's he saying? This is so interesting because when we read, um, it's like when I first, when Kenneth first started reading Luther's, I think it was Bondage of the Will or or his commentary on Galatians. He said it was was almost like I wrote the book. (laughs) Not to say that he's, uh, he's a, uh, his literary expertise is, could be compared with Luther, but the content. We believe the same thing. What have I been saying over and over and over again? What's he saying here? That he may show us our duty and make use of exhortations as a mean whereby he works upon his own. What's he saying? God's commands are his enablings. That's exactly what he's saying. Remember in Psalm 50 that we just read, he said, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such in one as thyself. God is telling us that he's not the God that we think he is. We think God is trying to tell us, yeah, you're a bad person, so clean up your act. Through the command to repent. Hear it again. Show us our duty. And make use of exhortations as a mean whereby he works upon his own. For example, Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, which says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Well, wait a second. Is there any possibility, spiritually speaking, that when all is said and done, a true Christian, elect of God, is going to be conformed to this world? What is salvation but deliverance from conformity to this world? So why does he command us to be conformed to this world when there's no possibility that we won't be conformed to this world, that we will be conformed to this world? Why? Because of what he just said. He makes use of exhortations as a mean whereby he works upon his own. That exhortation to be not conformed to this world carries with it omnipotent power to cause you not to be conformed to this world. Or in the words of this same apostle, John, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in them, is not in him. So when he commands us to love not the world, that command comes with it, the power to enable us not 
to love the world. So we're speaking of God's dealings with the Christian in his command for us to repent. And repentance is a lifelong uh, process, as it were. Charnock, Stephen Charnock, the 17th century Puritan, wrote a book entitled The Existence and Attributes of God. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such in one as thyself. Well, what is God? Who is God? What are his attributes? The primary attribute in God is stated in Isaiah. God's primary attribute. His attribute, we could say, his attribute of attributes is found in Isaiah 6, 3. And one cried, the seraphims, one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, In the Jewish mind, the way that the Jews emphasized something was they emphasized something by way of repetition. As Christ constantly said, verily, verily, I say unto you. Instead of saying, hey, this is really important, guys. Listen up. Verily, verily, I say unto you. In Isaiah 6, 3, he says, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God of hosts. This is the only attribute in Scripture which is raised, as it were, to the third power. But when we say that holiness is God's attribute of attributes, we're not merely saying that holiness is more important than His other attributes. What we're saying is this, is that an understanding of All of God's other attributes is contingent upon our understanding of His holiness. Without understanding the holiness of God, you understand nothing about God because holiness means set-apartness. Holiness means I'm not the one that you thought I was. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. Guess what? No matter what... Whatever you used to think, whatever you thought about me from your birth, from the time you first started going to church, I'm not that. God's set-apartness is His holiness. For example, to explain what we mean by this, if you ask a natural man, what are some attributes of God? It doesn't matter what he says. Oh, I think it's such a... No. I think it's a... No. I think it's a... Two circles. The answer is no. What about this? Think think about this one now. Suppose the natural man says, uh, is omnipotence one of his attributes? What would we say? No. Why? Because his concept of omnipotence is in here. It ain't in here. You got it? His concept of omnipotence goes something like this. We were reading about the, 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 the first uh, atom bomb which was dropped and it said something like it's like 10,000 10, times the power uh, of, a, of, a, of a regular bomb. You got that? So omnipotence would be some, something like 10 nuclear bombs or 100 nuclear bombs or 1,000 nuclear bombs. Whereas... In reality, when we speak of the omnipotence, God, the omnipotence of God, we are speaking of a God. Uh, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of God who commanded the light. To, omnipotence means bringing something out of nothing and they will never admit to that. Their whole religion is from something to something else. Their whole religion is, tell, like when I went to China, what you, if you ask a Chinese, what is his religion? He will almost inevitably, if you give him enough time, usually it happens pretty fast, but if you give him enough time, he will say this, religions are all the same. 
They all urge people to do good. You see it? So I might need a little power. I might need a lot of power. I might even need that omnipotence to help me to do in here something better than I don't think I can do right now. You see now? Why the holiness of God is His attribute of attributes because without an understanding of His other thanness, you understand nothing about God. And here's a good paradox. Here's another paradox. This is a real paradox. The more the Christian realizes God's holiness, the more zealous he is to understand who God is, knowing at the same time that all and any understanding he has of God is given to him by God. The more zealous he is to understand who this God is, knowing. See, Christians read the Bible. That's why we're not Christians anymore in the church. Talk to a normal Christian. I was talking to a Christian. He said, oh, we're starting a church. Uh, and I was just happened to be talking. I just happened to mention Martin Luther, and I looked at his. His eyes were glazed over. I said, you do, <laughs> you do know who Martin Luther was? Starting a church. You do, do know who Martin Luther was, don't you? He said, Martin Luther King. <laughs> the reason why we're not Christians anymore is what one, I mean, one evident, we don't know the scripture. A person who understands the holiness of God is so zealous to find out who God is, knowing at one and the same time that anything he understands of God has been given to him by God, the one who is the set-apart one. I told you before, my favorite movie is The uh, Wizard of Oz. And my favorite line out of that movie is when Dorothy gets to, to the wizard and she says, you're a very bad man. And the wizard says, Oh, no, 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 no. I'm a very good man. I'm a very good man. I'm, a bit, I'm the opposite of what you said. I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. He didn't say I'm not a very good wizard. He, she said, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, I'm a very good man. I'm just a very bad wizard. You see it? That's what You see why that's my favorite movie? We're off to see the wizard, the wonderful wizard of Oz. We hear, he is a whiz of a whiz, if ever a whiz there was. If, <laughs> if ever, oh, ever a whiz there was, the wizard of Oz is one because, 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 because of the wonderful things he does. And they find out that the wizard is indeed a wizard because he tells you, you're the wizard. That's the false gospel. The relationship to repentance is this. Repentance. Remember last week, Isaiah, excuse me, Acts 20, 21. Paul said our message, his message was the same message as John the Baptist. His message was repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he doesn't just say repentance. What do we say repentance means? Etymologically speaking, a change of mind. Repentance toward God. A change of mind to where we see that God, that, that, that there is an objective basis for law. And think about this. Why I was, I was, I was going to ask uh, Al, or I did, I, I can't remember if I asked you or not, after we left Idaho, just before we left Idaho, I noticed that there was a monument of the Ten Commandments in front of the courthouse in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I, I asked him, I think I asked him, go take a picture of that because I know it's not going to be there long. But guess what? By the time I asked him, it was already gone. What does that mean? When you remove the Ten Commandments from a courthouse, it means they're saying there is no objective. 
objective basis for... Why did they put that in the first place? There is an objective basis for law. And that was written in stone, meaning that it is a perpetual obligation. You're saying repentance toward God means, first of all, you're admitting for the first time that there is an objective, not what you like, what you think is God. I've asked people over and over again. Tell me, if these two sentences are the same, are they expressing the same idea? Number one. First sentence, second sentence. Are these sentences, do these two sentences mean the same thing? Number one. I'm a good person. Number two. I like myself. You see it? Do you see it? Yeah, most, to most people, they mean exactly the same thing. What do I mean by that? I'm a good person. What that means is, to the natural man, my actions comport with my standard of good behavior. Well, whose actions don't, right? I'm a good person because I love myself. But repentance means I'm admitting that there is an objective basis for law and it's God's Decalogue, God's Ten Commandments written in stone and then at one and the same time, I'm totally unable to keep them. In fact, In facing the Ten Commandments, I see just what the Westminster Confession, chapter 6 says. I am utterly indisposed to all good. I'm utterly disabled to all good. I'm made opposite to all good and wholly inclined to all evil. Repentance toward God. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Without repentance toward God, without a realization of your total inability to perform anything of that which is required, which is demanded of you. There is no faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ because faith in the Lord, what did we say? Faith faith has a subjective element and faith has an objective element. Remember that? What is the subjective element of faith? Faith just means belief. Come on, it ain't no complicated term. Belief subjectively and belief objectively. Saving faith is belief subjectively that I am the very opposite of what God demands me to be. Objectively, faith is my only hope is in the one who said, I have done all things. I do all things. John 8, 29. Let's look at that. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone because I do all those things. And he that sent me is with me. We just read that, didn't we? The Father hath not left me alone for I do all always those things that please him. Subjective faith, objective faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the cowardly lion, when he he got two odds, what did odds tell him? He said, oh, wait, 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 no, 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 no. You're not a cowardly lion. You're not, you don't need me. The only thing you need is a medal. See, the false gospel, you see the false gospel? The only thing you, hey, you've already got, you're just as brave as any other line has ever been. All you need is a medal. And that's what the false gospel tells us. Christ's death did not procure the salvation of any man, but merely made the salvation of all men possible means that, that, that it's not what Christ did that makes the difference between heaven and hell. It's what you do with what he did. You are the star of the show. You get the medal. False gospel. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this another Lord's day. We thank thee that we understand owing to the enlightenment of thy spirit. 
that thou hast given us subjective faith to see that we are totally, utterly incapable to do that which thou dost demand of us and that our only hope is in our total despair of anything that we can do. And our only hope is in the perfect, unadulterated righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. Turn, stand and turn to 159. Is, is it working on the Scottish Hope? Uh, is that song working? If not, it's on Psalm 123, 124. Psalm 123. Yeah. The tune, yes. Just the two in here.